Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Uh, today we talk about a very iconic sword, which I'm sure, sure most of you know. And for those of you who don't know it, well, you've come to the right place because we're going to look at it in detail. Um, but I'm sure you recognize it because it's one of the most recognizable European swords from the late 19th century. Uh, specifically, this is a IOD 89, a German IOD 89. IOD stands for Infanterie Offizier Degen, so sword for the infantry officer. And um, 89 stands for the year of its uh, entry into service, which is 1889. It was used all the way through World War I, uh, so it did see uh, active combat, although it was not necessarily a sword designed um, for combat. By this time, um, swords are already kind of not the core uh, part, are not part of core military tactics anymore. Uh, nevertheless, it's a rather lovely sword. <clears throat> um, you'll often see it referred to as a Prussian uh, IOD. Uh, that could be correct, but it is technically a German sword um, in the sense that this comes as part of uh, the modernization and standardization process uh, of the German Empire after its unification. So this happened in 1871 after the um, Prussian victory over France in the Franco-Prussian War. And um, before that, um, German officers were using a old-fashioned model of sword. It was actually called a, referred to as an uh, Alter Art, so old style, which was more reminiscent of uh, small swords, late 18th century kind of uh, court swords, spadroons also. Um, that's not to say that this sword substituted the Alter Art completely. They still existed in parallel even during World War I, but this became the standard German sword. Uh, it was used by a variety of different units, and it exists in a variety of um, iterations. So, the, well, and these can help us actually identify a specific sword uh, or place it in time more precisely, or place too. So um, one of the big variations is the decorations. So we'll look at that into more detail uh, in just a bit. But what kind of decorations you have on the shell guard and on the grip will determine whether a sword is, for example, Prussian or from one of the other many states that composed the German Empire. They can even help us identify what units or troops use a specific sword. Uh, other variations we have are in the shell guard. So most of them you'll find with a hinged guard, um, guard here. Uh, not all of them are hinged, some are fixed. And in some cases, this upturned lip is also hinged. So you have a double hinged guard. And we also have uh, deluxe variations. So they have a more prominent uh, guard. And we also have a scaled down version, uh, which is actually more of a dress sword, but technically that's a different model, so we won't really talk about it. Uh, other um, variations that can help us uh, place it in time, at least broadly pre World War I and during World War I, are in the material the hilt is made out of. So uh, brass was used before World War I. Uh, but as brass was a very needed uh, metal during the war, uh, usually for making, for example, shell casings, uh, they, substituted the, um, they substituted it for a ferrous alloy or metal um, when building hilts during the war. So if you find hilts that are blackened or have a don't look like brass or gilded, but underneath the gilding you see a like steel or metal, uh, like a silvery metal color. Those are probably, uh, not probably, those are usually swords produced during World War I. And you can, they're referred to as Kriegs swords, Kriegs Dagen, I think, so war swords. Um, moving on to the blade, um, variations are in the maker's marks. So these were made obviously in huge numbers. And uh, that means that uh, we have different makers from Solingen usually making them, so that can help place them. And then in terms of less uh, official variations, as we know, officers at the time really enjoyed bringing their personality and flair into their equipment. 
So you may have different blade configurations or uh, decorated, etched, um, engraved, gilded or blued blades as well. Uh, however, this would be the standard issue uh, blade. So a straight, double fullered, nickel plated blade. Um, also, before I forget, it has a leather um, finger ring. So I think that's uh, all of the information, uh, the broad information, and uh, let's uh, look at it in, in close up. Okay, let's uh, start looking at the blade. Um, the first thing we notice is the maker's mark we have here. So we have a W, K, and C with a crowned head and also a knight in a helmet next to it. Uh, this would stand for Weyersberg and Kirschbaum. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, a very, very known, well-known and historically, uh, very, it's a, a maker from Solingen that has been around forever, basically. Uh, we have this Ricasso which is relatively consistent, but it's not huge. And then we have the nickel plated blade, uh, double fullered. And the double fuller goes kind of quite a ways up in the blade, almost, almost up to the tip. We have a spear tip, which you do not want to be poked by, to be honest. And uh, as far as I've read, most of these were not service sharpened. So a lot of these were, as I mentioned, they were not necessarily designed for combat. Uh, however, this one has been sharpened. It's not super sharp anymore. So I'm not too concerned about running my finger along it. But I would be pretty concerned if someone swung this at me, to be honest. So let me see if I can get it in focus. We can see maybe some file marks. Lighting today is not um, ideal. Okay, there we go. So I don't know if you can see it, but there are some file marks on the edge. So this was sharpened for use at some point. And actually even the false edge here at the tip is sharp as well. So, well, was sharp, but it retains some sharpness. So overall, you'll see the blade has some damage to it. It has some um, uh, black spots, but in the conditions I received, it even has some nicks actually. So there you go. But in the conditions I received it in, I am very surprised that it turned out this uh, good looking. I was afraid that the most of the nickel plating would have been completely eaten off under the rust and uh, deposit, but it's actually looking quite good. Okay, moving to the hilt. So as I mentioned, we have um, different, well, let me turn around so the eagle is heads up. So as I mentioned, we have different sim symbols for different swords. This one would be Prussian. You see the eagle of uh, Prussian symbol with a crown and some regal symbols and symbols of power. You also see a monogram, which may be hard to uh, recognize here, but it's a W uh, for Kaiser Willem II. Uh, there is a more high definition version of it here on the grip. You see a W with a Roman numeral two under here and a crown. So it's uh, Kaiser Willem II. Um, this, as I mentioned, could be uh, switched and changed depending on, um, and this too, of course. So uh, different German states would have different symbols and different um, uh, monograms or symbols on the grip, but also certain units may have had approval to have different symbols. So for example, if you see a star, that is a sign that the sword was used by the guard, or sometimes they may have like a trumpet under here or other symbols that can help better identify what unit a sword was assigned to. Um, still talking about the grip, it has this wonderful shagreen um, cover. So the grip itself is uh, made of wood but then it's covered in shagreen. Unfortunately, this one is slightly dirty or uh, stained, but overall it's in really good condition. There's no lacks or in no point has it broken off yet. Um, one interesting thing is also the wire twisting. So I think it's good that it's a little bit loose here so we can actually see the configuration. You'll see there are two 
um, thin threads that are kind of sandwiching a thicker thread. So we have this triple thread running around the grip, making it quite a beautiful, yeah, giving quite a beautiful pattern to it. There is no back strap. So um, the shagreen is also on the spine of the grip. And then we have the pommel area here. So there is this pommel cap that goes over the end of the grip. And the peen, the blade peen is actually hidden underneath this end cap. Um, also, the, you can see the very characteristic 45 degree angle semi pistol grip. Um, yeah. As for the knuckle bow, um, we see it's rather simple. It kicks off here at the bottom. It's non-symmetrical, so it has this extra ridge on one side. And then this evolves into a rather uh, shallow um, branch over here. We then have this upturned lip, which I mentioned could be hinged in some cases. And the quillen is also kind of a evolved quillen in the sense that it's uh, integrated in the, uh, in the guard. And it's just basically an upturned lip over here. Another thing to notice is the um, leather uh, finger loop or finger ring here. So this is very, it's quite delicate because it dried off over time. So it's going to need a little bit of conditioning to get back to uh, being able to be touched safely. And you can see traces of gilding, of course, specifically here where the gilding was protected by the um, leather washer. And one last thing is this, uh, the hinge mechanism here. In some cases, would have been, um, you would have been able to fix it in place, but in this case, it's either broken or was never there, so I'm not really sure. So there we go, the IOD 89. So I hope you enjoyed this sword. Um, as I mentioned, there are countless variations of it and some can actually be fairly rare, if not very rare. So even though you'll find a lot of these and they just like, uh, you'll see them for sale very often in auctions and everything, always keep an eye out for details because if something doesn't look typical, it just might be a little treasure you just found. So again, uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.